This video has something that all developers should know. It's how to add a sprinting feature to your game in Roblox Studio. You're gonna be learning a few things like the Roblox Players Service, the Roblox Context Action Service, along with key code values and user input states. And this is all to add a sprint feature to your game that is compatible on mobile devices, PC, and consoles like Xbox. So let's get into it. This tutorial is already assuming you know how to open up Roblox Studio and get to a blank base plate. First thing we're doing is go heading on over to the Explorer, which is found on my right hand side. If you cannot find the Explorer in your Roblox Studio, on the top, click the View tab, and then on the very left, you'll see an Explorer button. You can make the Explorer go away or show up at the click of a button. On the Explorer window, let's go down to Starter Player. Click the arrow to drop down more items, and you'll see two folders in there, Starter Character Scripts and Starter Player Scripts. Click the Starter Character Scripts and click the plus sign you'll see a text box show up saying search object type in local and you'll see local script show up on there that's what you want now you'll see another tab popped up that says local script and it says print hello world let's go ahead and clear that out and begin writing our script where if a mobile player presses the sprint button they'll sprint if a pc player presses the left shift button on their keyboard they'll sprint and if a person on xbox presses the x button on their controller they'll sprint so let's get that working i believe it's very important for your game to be cross-platform compatible because that is going to become the future standard for all games that release. So to begin writing our script, we're going to call two services. The first one is called players. And in order to call a Roblox service, it's very easy. It's game colon get service. And you can see that's popping up on my screen already. So I'm just going to press enter and then put some quotation marks in those parentheses. And the service that I want is players. So I start typing in players and you can see it shows up automatically and I press enter. The next service we want is called context action service and we get that in the same manner game colon get service quotation mark context action service roblox services give us convenient properties and functions that we can use to easily program our games in roblox studio so let's first go into the player service we're going to need to pull something called the humanoid and that's on every single player in roblox let me show you an example. I've pulled in a dummy rig and let's take a look at the anatomy of this dummy rig. When we take a look at the workspace explorer area and click the drop down in the dummy, you can see that there's a humanoid inside of that dummy. And when we look at the properties of that humanoid, what we'll find is a property called walk speed. And this is the default walk run speed of a Roblox character, it's 16. If we happen to increase that value, then our character will run faster. And if we decrease this value, our character will run slower. In the case of our script, we want our player to run faster or we want our player to run at the default speed. So let me teach you how to programmatically find the humanoid of a player in a Roblox game. Because this is a local script, this script is practically embedded into the player of our Roblox game. So in order to access their humanoid, we need to access something called their local player. And the player service allows us to do that easily with a property called local player. And I forgot the S on that. So this is calling the player's service, getting the local player property, and it'll return our player that has this local script parented to them. In our case, it'll be our player in our game. Now the humanoid is nested in something called the character. I'm gonna show you guys some more examples. I'm gonna go ahead and click play on our game. Now when I'm referring to the player's service in Roblox, if we take a look at our Explorer, you'll see something here called players. That's the player service. If we click the drop down menu, you could see Chris ATM. That's me. I'm the player. Inside of here, there is no humanoid. There's only our GUI stuff and our backpack stuff, along with our player scripts. These are all the default scripts from Roblox. Carrying on, in order to get our character, we need to go into the workspace of our game and access that character. So you can see in our player service, there's a player here. And in our workspace, there's also a player here. But this is actually my player's physical model in 3D space. This is what we call the character. Inside of that character, you'll find the humanoid. And in that humanoid, of course, we'll find the walk speed property. If I'm running around right now, that's the default speed, but let's go ahead and change it to something like 32, which is double the default speed. And now I run a lot faster. Let's change it to quadruple the default speed. And now I run super speed. Now let's change it to something slow like one. And now I run way too slow to even move. Now I just walk. 
in really slow motion. That is the property that we need to alter, but we need to alter it by using code. So going back to that script, let's get this player's character model by saying local character, but I've abbre abbreviated it to char, equals player.character or player.character added. And then you'll want a wait function after that. Because sometimes in Roblox games, your character, because it's a character model in 3D space, has to load on the client player's machine. Sometimes that character model doesn't load right away and the rest of the script will begin running an error out because the character model has not loaded. It's important to say, or player.character added wait. And that means, hey, if there's no character loaded yet, let's wait until it is. When that character is loaded, we have to wait for the humanoid that's underneath that character that I showed you earlier to load in as well. One trick I like to use is to repeat a wait function until we find a first child in the character called a humanoid. So I could do a whole video in itself talking about find first child character added, but because this is adding a sprint feature, I'm kind of just gonna gloss over all of this, but it's important that we have this in our script. Now we know that our humanoid is gonna be character.humanoid and our script will wait until that humanoid is loaded. When that humanoid is loaded, we know that our character.humanoid is there and we've named a local variable after it. So now we get to call this humanoid anywhere and alter the walk speed property. So let's create a function that does that now. We'll type in local function handle sprint. Open and close parentheses and I press enter and it automatically closes out that function for me with a little end statement there. What I want in this function is a parameter that tells me whether we should be sprinting or not. So I'm gonna call this parameter should sprint. Now we're gonna add a conditional statement that says if should sprint equals true, then, and after I type in then and press enter, it closes out that statement for me. So if should sprint equals true, then we want our humanoids walk speed property to equal two times the default walking value. So we pretty much just doubled our humanoids walk speed. Another way to do that would be to say something like this. So let's go ahead and comment out this statement by adding two hyphens in front of it. When you comment out a statement in your code, it doesn't run. So we've pretty much just like wiped this out as if it doesn't exist. So I'm gonna replace it with another statement that says, hey, let's take the humanoid's walk speed and just multiply it by two. So I'm saying multiply the humanoid's walk speed by two and let's get that value. So that's just a shorter way to write it. Now, we can, in our if statement, we can add something called an else and press enter. And so if should sprint is anything else but true, which the only other value it can be is false because this is a Boolean, it's only true or false. So if should sprint, we'll, we'll type in a comment here. If should sprint equal false, then set walk speed to default value of 16. And so that's just a comment explaining what we're doing here. And so we're taking the humanoids.walk speed and we're making it equal to the default value of 16. So now we need a way to run this function. We haven't exactly taken in the inputs from a keyboard, from a controller, or from a touchscreen in order to run this function. So in order to do that, we finally have to use our context action service. So below all of that, let's write another local function called listen inputs open close parentheses. And this is where we'll begin to use our context action services. Now, the reason I put everything into functions first is because I like my code to be organized and it makes things expandable. Now in our function, listen inputs, let's call the context action service and context action service has a function called bind action. Now, the reason why I like to use Roblox's context action service is because it makes it extremely easy to take in all three inputs from all three platforms mobile PC and Xbox. I always go on the Roblox documentations and the link to this documentation will be in the description below because it always tells us the kinds of properties, events, and methods, I've been calling them functions, they call them methods, that come with their services that can be useful to us. So let's take a look at the methods here. Here's the method called bind action. And what it wants is the action name, which is gonna be called sprint. It wants the function that we want to bind, which would most likely be handle sprint, but we're gonna put another function in between that. And then another parameter of whether we want a touchscreen button to be added on the mobile device, and we'll set this to true 
true because that is a Boolean value. And then any additional input types, which is gonna be our keyboard and game controller. So let me show you all how to write this and make sense of it in code. Here's our bind action method. And Roblox is already telling us that it wants us to give them an action name. So we already know in quotation marks, that's what a string is. We type in sprint and there's our first parameter. And we close out our first parameter by adding a comma. And now our second parameter is the function we want to bind. Now we can put handle sprint in here, but I wanna abstract this a step further by adding a handle input function. Let's put a comma to close that out. The next parameter is whether we should create a touch button or not. So we're gonna say true for that. We're gonna add a comma. And beyond that are any other additional inputs we want the context action service to listen to and have the handle input function run. So in order to say that we want the left shift button on the keyboard to be listened to, we say enum.keycode dot left shift. I wanna remind all of you that lowercase and uppercase letters matter in your code. So you can see that the K in key code is capitalized and the C in key code is capitalized. The L in left shift is capitalized and the S in left shift is capitalized. So always keep that in mind. And then on the Xbox controller, I want the X button to be listened to. So that'll be button X. We'll save that. Always press control S to save your your scripts. You never want to lose them. Studio could crash. Your game could crash. Always press control S so you always save your scripts. Now you can see that handle input is underlined here. That means there's something wrong, right? We do not have a handle input function. Let's add that in between our handle sprint function and our listen inputs function. So I'll press enter to make some space and do local function handle input, open close parentheses and enter. That'll automatically close out our function there. And now you can see that underline under handle input went away. But now if we press the left shift key or the X button key or the mobile device on screen key, our handle input function will run, but there's nothing in there to run. So nothing will happen. So let's make something happen. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Roblox documentation. So that way I can better explain to you guys how to handle the parameters we receive when a user presses left shift or the X button and runs this handle input function. What's great about the Roblox documents is if we go over here and click methods and then we see this bind action, which we were looking at earlier and click bind action, the Roblox documentation website has a lot of example code for you to use. Um, it also explains to us the parameters that are passed when our user presses the buttons we're listening to. So three parameters are passed. The first is is the, the action name, which is the name of the action that we passed to bind action. I'll show you guys what that means in the script. So you can see here, we said this was a string called sprint. This is our bind action name. And in the documentation, it's saying that that's the first parameter that's returned when a user presses the button. The second parameter that's returned is the input state. And particularly what we wanna listen to is whether a user began to press the button and when they ended pressing the button. Because when we're sprinting, we hold down left shift so that we began to press left shift and we're running fast. And when we let go of left shift, the input has ended and we need to run slow. And then the third parameter that's passed is the input object, which contains more information about the input that was pressed. So what pressed it? Was it the game controller? Was it the keyboard? What key code was it? Things like that. For us today, we're gonna be looking at and using the first two parameters, but we'll still put the third parameter down. So going back to our code, let me show you guys what that looks like. When the handle input function runs, three parameters are passed the actions name, the input state, and the input object. Today, I'm gonna show you the parameters that are passed by printing them out in our outputs. So let's go ahead and put two print commands down and we wanna print the action name. And the second thing we wanna print is the input state. Another way we can write this, we can go ahead and comment this out. Another way we can write this is by saying, print the action name and then a comma and print the input state. So print both of them on one line. So look, let's go ahead and press play and we'll see exactly what the bind action function when listening to these inputs is passing over to us. But before we can test it, we need to tell our listen inputs function to run. So let's go ahead and make some room on the bottom here and type in listen inputs on the very bottom with an open and close parentheses and leave it like that, save it. So when this script runs, it'll find the humanoid, it'll pass all of these functions 
functions and it'll run the listen inputs function. The listen inputs function will begin the bind action function. Listen to the left shift key, the button X key, the touch screen key. And if any of those are pressed, it'll run the handle input function. And when the handle input function runs, it'll print the action name and the input state. So if you click play up at the top over here, and once we load into game, I'm going to press and hold down the left shift key. And we're going to take a look at the output here and see what it says. So press and holding now. And so you can see that sprint is our action name. That's the first parameter. And our second parameter is enum.userInputState.begin. So that means that I have begun pressing the left shift key. Now I'm going to let go of it. I'm going to let go of the left shift key now. And you can see that the same sprint has come up as the action name, but the user input state is now end. This is how we're going to know when we need to start sprinting and stop sprinting because the player is going to be able to tell us. So let's press stop, go back to our script. And now what we're going to say is delete all this. And we're going to say if the action name is equal to sprint, then. And that's our first conditional statement. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because remember, we want our code to be expandable. So what if we have something like another action name called punch? And that's the reason why I write my code the way I do in case I ever want to handle more inputs. So for example, if I have another bind action and I call this punch, and let's say I want it to be the F key and I want it to be the B button on the controller. So now handle input will run. It'll pass over punch when I press the F key, and then we can say what to do with it. For the purposes of this tutorial, we're only going to leave it at sprint, but I'm just giving you the reasoning as to how I structure my code. So now if the action name is equal to sprint inside of that conditional statement, we're going to have a local variable called should sprint, and we're going to make it equal to false. So now by default, we should not be sprinting. That's why it's set to false. We're going to have another conditional statement nested inside of this first conditional statement, and we're going to say if the input state that's passed as a parameter is equal to enum.userInputState.begin. And remember, I got this from our output here, enum.userInputState.begin. Then close that out. Then we should be sprinting. So our should sprint value should be equal to true. Now, outside of that conditional statement, we're going to run our handle sprint function. So we're going to say handle sprint. And in the parameter that we're going to pass to our handle sprint function is going to be the should sprint variable. So let's go ahead and put that in there. We're going to save and let's go see if our code works. So we'll click play. We're going to see if it works. And if it works, I'm going to break down the code for you again, just to have a full overview for all of you. So let's go ahead and run normal. And then I'm going to press shift and now I'm running faster and I'm going to let it go. And now I'm running normal again. I have my controller with me. If I move the joystick, I move. And if I press the X button, I run faster. If I let it go, I run slower. So let's go ahead and stop. We know that the code works now, but let me show you guys something else before we do our overview. Go back to your 3D space. On the top right hand corner, right next to the Explorer, if your Explorer is there, there's a little mobile device button. Press that button. So now you can see your screen turns into a mobile device. For the purposes of the video, I'm going to make the mobile device larger. And so now when we click play, what you'll find is that there's a little button next to this jump button that shows up. And that is actually our sprint button for mobile. So when we press this button, this player will be able to sprint. Now, unfortunately on the computer, I can't really like get this to do that because I don't have two thumbs to use. But yeah, right next to the jump button, that's our sprint button. So I'm going to teach you guys how to put a title on this. Going back to our code, context action service has a function called set title. So in our listen inputs function, on the next line below the bind action function, let's call context action service again, call the set title function. And then we want to set the title of our sprint action to sprint. So let's go back to our game, click play. And now you can see that the player will know that this is the sprint button and this is how we're going to sprint. And it's conveniently right next to the jumping button. And so that's how we become mobile compatible. Okay. So let's break down this code. We call two services from Roblox, which has a lot of convenient properties and methods for us to use. The first service is players. The second service is context action service. We first use the player service to get the characters humanoid. 
We had to wait for the character to load, and then we had to wait for the humanoid to load. After the humanoid loaded, we're now able to use code to alter any values or properties in the humanoid to make a sprint, namely the walk speed property. So in order to do that, we start at the very bottom of the script, and we ran a function called listen inputs. Our listen inputs function ran two context action service functions. The first one was the bind action. We assigned a name to it called sprint. We said anytime that a player presses the mobile touch button, the left shift button on the keyboard, or the X button on a game controller, run the handle input function. And then on the next line, we ran a context action service function called set title, and we set our sprint binded action button name to sprint. So anytime anyone presses these buttons, the handle input function runs. When the handle input function runs, three parameters are passed, the action name, the input state, and the input object. In our function, we only utilize the action name and the input state. And we said, if the action name is sprint, then let's set a variable of should sprint to equal false. And if the input state is begin, then let's set our should sprint value to true, meaning we should actually be sprinting. And then let's run the handle sprint function and pass over this should sprint value. So we go up to the top here, when our handle sprint function runs, we know whether we should be sprinting or not. So if should sprint is equal to true, then let's walk two times as fast as our default walk speed value or our current walk speed value. Otherwise, if should sprint is any other value besides true, which most likely it's gonna be false, then let's set our humanoid walk speed to the default value of 16. And that's how our script runs, everyone. The link to the game is in the description of this video. You can play it. But over here on the top right-hand corner, right next to the title of the game, you'll see three dots. You can click that. And if you click edit, it'll open up Roblox Studio for you. And the place will open up for you. When it does, you'll find the script in the starter player and then the starter character scripts. And it's called local script. You could just double click it. You'll be able to see the code that I provided to you. And then if you go back to the 3D space and then go to the top left and click file, you can click download a copy and then you can save it on your local storage device. 